So uh, Jenny and, and I will um, try to recognize everybody, um, but thank you all for joining us this way. Our Ken and, and Christine and, and uh, Sarah, uh, we're very happy to have you. The first subject really is the closure of Woodside, um, which was fairly abrupt and moving it to St. Albans. And then what is going on with Woodside? I think those are the two subjects for the first hour really is, is how is that working? Um, and what is the plan with, with, with the current Woodside? Which I guess I should call the other one Sweet 12. And yes. Ken, do you wanna start or? I don't mind starting. This is uh, Ken Schatz. I'm the commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. I do appreciate uh, the two committees coming together so that we can consolidate our comments. I, I know you do appreciate we're all working very hard to address uh, the uh, pandemic. Sarah and I have been in close contact over the past weeks to try to do our best to manage uh, our concerns. And this may be a bit of a repeat for the Senate Judiciary Committee because we talked about this last week. But to confirm what Senator Sears uh, just said, uh, the background is essentially uh, going back to Sunday, March 22nd. Uh, Sarah notified uh, us at DCF that the Department of Mental Health recognized working with the other hospitals caring for psychiatric patients, that there was a very emergent concern about how to appropriately care for those patients who exhibited um, COVID-19 symptoms. Sarah can talk more about it, but with respect to recognizing we needed a separate facility potentially to care for those patients, and recognizing that Woodside with only four youth there was essentially an underutilized facility, we got together and quickly recognized that it would the facility would be better suited to meet this emergent need. So we quickly looked for another site to move those youth. We got a lot of support from the department, from the um, State Emergency Operations Center and all the staff quickly identified through uh, NCSS in St. Albans that they had a site that was not currently being utilized, which is known as Suite 12, because that's what it, where it is in the building. And so we quickly moved to um, set up that facility to move our youth there. Uh, and we did so within a matter of days with the support from the Department of Mental Health and other people to uh, enable them to ready the uh, Woodside site for, in effect, its new use. So we did temporarily, this is all um, responding to the emergent need with respect to the pandemic. We temporarily closed Woodside for Youth, moved over to Suite 12 to enable the Department of Mental Health to provide a new use for that facility. Maybe I should stop there if, and then turn it over to Sarah, if that's what the committee's interest for her to give you more information about what's actually going on there. Yeah, that would be fine. I, uh, how many kids are at Woodside, are at Suite 12 right now? Four. There? Four. So, okay. Uh, and Thank are you. those the four uh, from Woodside? No, actually it changed. Okay. It, it, as you may know, the youth who, who have um, issues requiring residential care um, is literally a day-by-day -day dynamic. So we do try to place youth in the most appropriate, least restrictive setting. Um, Suite 12 at this point is a uh, staff secure program um, that in one sense enabled us to open the doors, if you will, to children who are in custody as um, chins, that is abused or neglected or unmanageable, not for delinquency, because it's not a locked facility, that gave us more flexibility, but to be candid, also with the reduced level of security that has posed some other issues. So to cut to the chase a little bit, I don't wanna take time away from Sarah, but frankly, we're looking for another site because we did think that we would be able to lock the doors and put alarms on the windows, but the landlord indicated uh, we were not able to do so. So we're quickly looking for a secure facility to stand up uh, for this purpose. 
Well, okay. that... are, are so all of these children are on under some type of court order, not they're in not, the... a, not adjudicated necessarily. They're in the they're in this the the juvenile justice or okay. chin system, yeah, which okay. does clearly involve court. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any DOC kids there? There is one youth in uh, custody of the commissioner of corrections. Uh, I I had no I. I had heard an inkling that you weren't able to alarm the doors or, or windows, and I feel very concerned about that. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, having operated 206 depot, I gotta get my depots right. Much more of the first things we did even before we took kids was put alarms on the windows and doors. And the, I don't know how you can operate a SAF secure program without, without that. So I'm, Glad you're looking for another facility. We are, and again, let me be clear: people are working really hard and really quickly to try to address all of the the needs that have arisen with respect to uh, COVID-19. And this is just one of those things we had thought we had a site that would really work, and honestly, discovered that it doesn't. So we're looking for another. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Ken? So, I, I, Alice, I'd just like to say, so, Ken, are you able at Suite 12 to take in a child who might need a secure facility, or where would you put a child such as that if one came? So, it would depend. So, the reality is we do have a substantial number of staff where we have. Can't hear you. So we can provide a substantial amount of supervision. We also do have some other programs around the state that are still operating that can um, meet some unique needs if they arise. So we're definitely uh, doing our best to manage the population um, with what we've got. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Ken, thanks very much. You, you remember from the Judiciary Committee meeting, I tried to forward some concerns from workers. And at that time, you hadn't had a chance to connect directly with them. Can you just update us on that? Sure. So we have had direct conversation uh, formally uh, th through Christine and myself connecting to the VSCA, the, the uh, union leadership. We've also um, encouraged our staff at Suite 12 to have direct communication with staff. Um, we've addressed a lot of their needs. Uh, for example, uh, one of the concerns that staff raised that uh, Senator Baruth mentioned was um, concern about sleeping arrangements for overnight staff. And so what we did was um, we actually thought that uh, the union had a good idea and we responded immediately to set up a hotel room that they could sleep in if they were staying overnight. Um, and so that's certainly one example of how we did respond to their needs. And so the, the, certainly the discussions continue uh, as we uh, figure out the best way to manage and operate this program. Thank you. Other questions for Ken or Christine? Ken, hang in there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ginny, do you wanna, <clears throat> this is more your area of the mental health field issues, but uh, Commissioner yeah. Squirrel, if you could kind of go over now what's happened. The last time I knew you were gonna take over the Woodside property and bulldoze it, and we had this picture of you driving the bulldozer. Um, that's all changed. Yeah, so happy to, to speak to uh, what we're thinking about in terms of uh, creating emergency inpatient capacity. Uh, so Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health, um, thanks to the committee for inviting us to testify today. Um, I did want to note for the committee, I do have an emergency meeting at 11 o'clock that I do have to attend. Um, so I will try to address everything um, and all of your questions between now and then and could certainly try to pop back on after that. But I just wanted to, to flag that for you all. Um, so as we at the Department of Mental Health are, are grappling with um, this public health emergency, and certainly when you're dealing with an infectious disease outbreak, you're always behind where you think you are. Um, so we have been trying to think proactively about um, in two to three weeks um, when our healthcare systems are um, possibly going to be overwhelmed, uh, what kind of inpatient capacity do we need to have in the system of care? Um, so on Friday, March 20th, we convened all of hospital leadership from across the state 
who manage inpatient psychiatric hospitals and patients. That includes the University of Vermont Medical Center, Rutland Regional Medical Center, CVMC, the VA, the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, and the Brattleboro Retreat. And the goal of this convening was really to assess the current risks to our system of care and to make a recommendation to ensure the health and safety of patients. Um, so the recommendation um, that we came up with um, as a collective group was that we needed to quickly identify and establish an alternative psychiatric facility with anywhere from 10 to 25 beds for individuals who have very significant psychiatric needs who are COVID positive, but their COVID positive symptoms might be mild. Um, so these would be individuals who um, absent their significant psychiatric needs from a medical standpoint would be asked to kind of manage their COVID symptoms at home. Um, as we all know, the individuals um, who might be involuntarily under the care and custody of the commissioner who have significant psychiatric needs, they would not have that option. Um, and we know that it's only a matter of time until we have COVID positive patients in our inpatient facilities. Um, it's only a matter of time before we have a COVID positive psychiatric patient waiting in an ED. Um, and it's possibly only a matter of time until our current medical bed capacity across the state is reached. Um, so our recommendation was to identify a facility. Um, as we looked across the state system, um, identifying a facility quickly that had that capacity and also was a place where we could um, treat individual safety, um, safely, meaning um, minimal uh, ligature risk. Uh, the Woodside facility certainly emerged um, as an option that we could move quickly on so we could stand up um, what was clear was a resounding need across the state. And this recommendation we think will achieve three primary goals. Um, Number one, we will maintain capacity to provide treatment and care to COVID positive patients um, who have mild symptoms, but very significant psychiatric needs. We will mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in inpatient facilities across the state um, to ensure the health and safety of individuals who are already receiving treatment. And we'll preserve resources and capacity within the broader, broader medical system for those who are the most medically acute. Um, Clearly, no one wants to be making these kinds of decisions, um, but we're facing a public health emergency that I haven't seen in my lifetime. It requires decisive and proactive um, decision-making to keep people safe. And as the commissioner of mental health, I did not want to wait for our healthcare system to be overwhelmed until we started to create um, an alternative facility. Uh, so that was our thinking. Um, and from a parity perspective, when we look at the broader healthcare system, we're all preparing for the surge. Um, that's why field hospitals are being erected um, and alternative facilities are being located. Um, I wanna be clear that this is designed to be a short-term emergency contingency youth of Woodside. Um, I would not, as the Commissioner of Mental Health, be recommending that in its current form and its current structure that we would utilize a correctional facility for care and treatment of psychiatric patients. Um, so the future of Woodside um, will remain a discussion and a decision for the legislature. Uh, this is simply a short-term emergency precautionary step to ensure that we have appropriate inpatient capacities. Um, so I'll, I'll just pause there um, as an overview um, I can also provide an update on uh, what we're doing in terms of the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence as well, if that is helpful for folks. Um, can I start, Dick? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, I have airplanes flying over me soon, so I can hear them coming. <laughs> if it sounds <laughs> loud, that's what it is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Commissioner, thank you very much. I, we uh, we all understand how busy you are, and we very much appreciate your being here, as well as Commissioner Schatz. Um, but at the point of the two committees, obviously, is to do, get as much information as we can so, to save you some time. My, my questions really go to the fit up of the, of the facility of Woodside and all the very practical questions about providing um, medical services while they're there. You did say that these were for those cases that are um, not as 
not as compelling. So that there are some people who will have to be hospitalized. Yes. So I actually have two questions in this. One is how is the how is Woodside being fit up with um, the the materials and provisions that you need, the equipment you need to take care for these people while they're ill, and then how are they being provided with the mental health care folks uh, and treatment that they need because they're going to need both, obviously, while they're there. Uh, so, how how what's that conversation about? How's that happening? When is it happening? If it isn't already, and then the second part of that. Um, uh, maybe I'll just hold off on the hospital question for a minute, but um, so let's go to, let's go first to the sort of the fit up both for the medical services and the psychiatric services that are needed during this process. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And certainly our team, as we've um, arrived at this recommendation um, on behalf of all of the inpatient hospitals across the state, we immediately established kind of a leadership operations team um, that could be on the ground um, at Woodside, really assessing the facility, um, ordering the appropriate equipment that would be needed. Um, BGS was there kind of cleaning and getting everything ready, food service, laundry, pharmacy. I mean, there is a long list of operational pieces that need to be put in place. Um, our leadership team includes existing staff from the Department of Mental Health, um, our medical director and social work. Um, and then what we've been doing is working closely with um, our staff at VPCH, the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, and the University of Vermont Medical Center to try to assess what clinical and medical capacity will be necessary so that we can provide adequate care. I also just wanna know that this is designed to be emergency surge capacity. As of right now, if there remains capacity within our medical system um, that any mental health patient um, who is COVID positive would be referred to the medical hospital unit and they would try to triage with site consultation. What we're preparing for is at the point that that capacity might be overwhelmed um, and what do we need to create to support that? Uh, so I think we also understand and recognize um, we are thinking about this from those individuals who have very mild symptoms. Um, you know, so we want to make sure that we we are um, understanding where the scope of our practice um, and expertise um, ends, mm -hmm. which is why we're trying to work with UVM uh, to assist with the appropriate medical personnel. Um, that we would need to have on site to provide that uh, care and treatment, um, knowing that currently with the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, we already contract with UVM for all of our psychiatry and our medical and physician support. So we'd be thinking about a similar model um, at Woodside, and this is all overlaid, of course, against the reality of just the overall staffing shortages that we're facing across the state and our ability to recruit nurses and mental health specialists right now is certainly one of the most significant barriers that we're looking at. Um, but that's just to give you a snapshot of some of the operational pieces that we're looking at on the ground. And that work has been, is well underway. So what I'm hearing you say is that you're looking at the current, the patients who are currently under the state care for this facility. There, um, is that, that, is that true, accurate in saying that? It could be. It could be individuals who might be in one of our inpatient facilities mm -hmm. um, who start to present symptoms, are tested, and are positive. Obviously, the individual facilities across the state are going to immediately put their protocols into place in terms of isolation, et cetera. Um, but we also want to mitigate the spread um, within our inpatient facilities to protect that capacity. Um, so this essentially becomes, if it's medically appropriate and the symptoms are mild, um, that they could be true, that they could receive um, their primary psychiatric care here and manage their mild COVID symptoms. The other area that we're thinking about might be the individual who also arrives in an emergency department who is experiencing a psychiatric crisis um, and who also is COVID positive. So I think it's existing within our inpatient system. It's also an individual who may emerge having psychiatric needs. 
and we want to ensure that we have appropriate capacity um, to provide care and treatment. So uh, then uh, what I'm hearing you say secondly is that someone who maybe is currently under the care uh, at Howard Center would go into the ED and might, because of their the level of uh, illness that they have, might be uh, sent to Woodside to isolate them from others uh, in a residential facility uh, with the Howard Center. Right. So essentially, if there was an individual um, who, who, you know, perhaps was, you know, a CRT client from the Howard Center, for example, um, who um, was deemed to meet hospital level of care for their psychiatric needs, um, normally we would be looking to admit them in one of our psychiatric facilities across the state. But then when you add on if they are COVID positive or they're being tested for COVID positive, obviously introducing that individual to an existing inpatient setting who doesn't have any COVID cases um, might not be in our best interest because we risk infecting that whole unit. Um, so this of course would provide some capacity where that individual could receive care and treatment for both their inpatient psychiatric needs and monitor their COVID symptoms. So and I, I don't wanna prolong my questioning because I think others might have questions, but uh... It, it seems to me that the capacity uh, at Woodside is in a, insufficient to cover what we're going to see as the needs going forward. Uh, that I don't, yeah, that I don't know. Um, as I said, um, we are, I am not waiting until the healthcare system to be overwhelmed to try to create capacity. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Our ability to recruit and have staffing, adequate staffing there um, will also impact the capacity we're able to stand up. Are you using any, are, will you be using any of the current staff at Woodside for this, knowing of course that they're more attuned to kids and adolescents, but um, how will that staffing take place? I, you're talking with all the hospitals, you're talking with um, the psychiatric, care facilities? Yes, yeah, so we have um, been actively looking at um, the emergency operations center at AHS also is trying to create some centralized functions for recruitment um, across our system of care, um, nurses being one of them, mental health specialists being another. Uh, we are also experiencing significant staffing shortages at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital as it stands. Um, so we are actively looking to recruit um, additional workforce um, for Woodside at this time. Oh, one last comment, and that is, and then I'm going to uh, let others uh, ask their questions, but um, is there any consideration for offering um, incentives? Uh, by that, I mean salary incentives for people who might be uh, invited to apply for these jobs? Yes, we are certainly um, looking at and in the process of implementing, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, a hazard pay premium, if you will, um, for individuals that might be working in these facilities. Could, could you expand on that a little bit, Commissioner? Because that issue has come up, I believe I spoke to you about it individually, actually. But that issue has come up um, in a num number of ways. Um, you've got people who are working at fairly low salaries and designated agencies and group homes and so forth. Will there be some effort to make it so, because now that the $600 a week uh, from the federal care program plus their unemployment, some people are saying, wow, it'll be cheaper to, uh, it'll be better for me to go unemployed, collect unemployment than go to work and face the possible hazard of transferring COVID-19 to my family, et cetera? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And just pivoting a little bit to um, some of the fiscal strategies that we're trying to um, provide across our state system and are uh, particularly focused on our community mental health partners, our designated agencies and their SSAs, um, both DMH and Dale um, immediately moved forward with um, creating flexibility within our existing funding streams. 
so that our designated agencies and specialized service agencies could continue to maintain their current staffing levels to the best of their ability. So what I mean very quickly is that DMH funding is through um, payment reform. We have a case rate. So we pay all the designated agencies a monthly prospective payment. So that has not changed. So all of our designated agencies and specialized service agencies continue to receive their monthly prospective payment. And we can adjust what will look differently on the back end in terms of utilization, the work use of telephonic um, billing, et cetera. The next phase that we're moving into is trying to assess the fiscal distress and additional pressure that COVID-19 is putting on our community partners. Um, one of the areas that has emerged as a priority from our discussions um, with our community mental health partners and our specialized service agencies is this capacity to provide hazard pay for direct care staff, particularly in residential settings. Um, so we actually have asked all of the designated um, agencies, um, most of whom operate um, significant residential programming group homes, um, to let us know what would that look like over the next eight to 12 weeks? Um, what would it look like to be able to provide that kind of enhanced pay to direct care staff? Um, and then we're going to take that kind of back at AHS and look at that within how do we map that against um, additional funding that we are looking at across our provider network that we might be able to provide to those providers. Um, so that is certainly something that has emerged very quickly as a priority from our providers. Um, and when we look at the work that AHS is doing, there's um, multiple tracks that we're looking at for providers. We're looking at our hospitals, um, we're looking at you know QHCs, other providers, and then we have a specific track where we're focusing on the needs of the designated agencies and the SSAs. So thank I, you. And that's yeah. um, if, if I could just finish that. That's uh, very helpful. If you could send us any information on that, um, I, I can tell you that based on an all Senate meeting this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an awful lot of us concerned about this issue, and Ken will be asking you about it later. So, so and as a as a follow up, I know that uh, I uh, would be I, it would be helpful, uh, Commissioner, mm -hmm. if you could send along the information. I know you sent some information along to some folks this morning. I will respond to that email and ask that I also get on that list if you don't mind, because we will we will be we're taking up our discussion I did have I have had an opportunity to talk with some of the DAs on this and mm -hmm. looking at what their deficit spending is right now given the emergency mm -hmm. it's significant as you know so two hundred and seventy thousand dollars a week for one organization um, and and then what that means if is if we're going to do what Senator Sears is suggesting um, and providing, as you said, hazard pay, the reconciliation of that is going to be extremely important, but the cash flow issue right now Huge. is pretty critical. So um, if you don't mind keeping us informed as much as possible, just when you send out an email, uh, send it um, to, uh, I think probably Senator Sears and myself as well, and then we'll we can uh, share that with our committees. That would, yes, would absolutely. And so, yeah, what you see us doing is trying to um, ensure that within existing resources and funding, that all that money is going out the door. So those prospective payments going out to the DAs on a monthly basis, eight point three million a month, those are still going. Um, you know, looking at getting our any other levers that we can pull to get money out the door in an expedited way, that money is going out the door. Um, some of our fee for service programs, particularly school based mental health, is a little trickier um, simply because school is not in session and we're trying to create flex flexibility within that. Um, but for many of our DAs, um, they rely um, on that billing and providing those services. Mm -hmm. That's an area that we're looking at as well. And then this phase two is what is above and beyond? What fiscal costs and distress are they experiencing? Um, and then how do we overlay that against 
um, what additional federal dollars might be coming in um, and try to figure out how to support um, the designated agencies and community. Uh, yeah. Thank you. We, we appreciate that. The work that you're doing is significant. Um, so, but there are a couple other questions go, coming up. Okay. Senator McCormick, I think, was first, and then Senator Ingram. Thanks. <clears throat> um, what is the protocol for a psychiatric patient who gets into the, whose symptoms are severe enough that, that they need ICU? We just send them to the hospital or? Yeah, we've, we've had a lot of conversations, almost daily conversations with our hospital partners. And as of right now, if we had a psychiatric patient um, who had significant mental health needs um, and significant medical needs related um, to COVID-19, they would be admitted um, to the medical facility. Um, that's what we're operating under right now. And then we're preparing for, you know, what happens when our healthcare system reaches a capacity and we're looking at med surge. Yeah, and I could, I could see where the argument, maybe if someone is in ICU, they're probably sick enough that they're not gonna be a problem anyway. But what if someone is violent, you know? And uh, what, what do we do for security at ICU? Yeah, well, I think that um, our inpatient facilities, looking at some of our larger ones, like a UVM, a CVMC, a Rutland, um, they have, they also run inpatient psychiatric units. Um, so they have their own internal capacity related to um, psychiatric consultation, folks that are used to working with individuals with um, <coughs> mental health challenges. So I think overall, many of our hospital partners um, are well poised to provide that support you know, for the individual yes. who is, you know, maybe level one at the highest level of acuity, uh, we probably as systems partners will have to triage around ensuring that an individual um, has the appropriate mental health support and can keep everyone safe. Thanks. That's my only question, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Debbie's next. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, Commissioner Squirrel, um, how how many patients? Uh, what what is the capacity of Woodside for these these um, psychiatric patients who are well? Yeah. So the the physical capacity of the building, I believe, is uh, twenty five to thirty. Um, we do not have anywhere close to adequate staffing capacity for that right now. Um, so we've basically been creating. You know, our first tier is, you know, okay, one to five patients, what's the minimum staffing grid that we have to have in place for that level of um, surge, if you will, five to 10, 10 to 15. Um, I'd say we're, we're quite a ways um, from having uh, the adequate um, clinical and medical staffing capacity um, to meet the full physical capacity of the facility right now. And then, um... I'm assuming that the like the best case scenario would be that um, a patient would go there and would get over uh, COVID would, would get better and then so so is there a like sort of a has the has your department been able to do kind of a trajectory of maybe perhaps moving people then back to, they go back to the facilities that they originally came from is that right and um, uh, and is there a, a sense of how long, you know, how much time they would be at Woodside and before they could go back or have you? Yeah, I think our, our goal would be um, as long as there is capacity um, within our in inpatient settings that are designed to be actually therapeutic treatment and environments, I would not say that Woodside would fit that category, um, that it would be our goal that um, individuals um, be transferred back um, to a therapeutic inpatient facility as soon as possible. Um, again, you know, that's all pending that there is capacity in that system um, that we can that we can utilize. Just to be clear, because I've had some criticism from some regarding warehousing. We're not warehousing people there. We're treating sick people who are ill from a from a virus and trying to get them through that. And at the same time, trying to tr help treat their mental illness. Is that correct or am I? Um, because what you had just responded to, obviously it's a temporary facility, but you're still providing treatment, correct? Absolutely. I mean, we will have our uh, clinical treatment teams 
will be there. Um, is Woodside ideal from a therapeutic standpoint? Absolutely not. We are far from ideal conditions right now, and we want to ensure that, again, I, I don't want individuals who have significant psychiatric needs to be in an unsafe situation in the community or anywhere, and we can't provide care to them and someone gets hurt, um, particularly for individuals um, who might be suicidal um, or having other um, risk of harm to the cells or others. Um, my priority is to ensure that we can still uh, provide safety and care for them. This is absolutely temporary and this is absolutely an emergency measure. Will the staff have emergency uh, protection gear, masks and et cetera? Yes, we have been working with the Emergency Operations Center to ensure that um, we have appropriate and adequate access to PPE. This morning, I read a horrifying story about the Veterans Home in Holyoke, Mass, um, where mm -hmm. I think 10 or 12 people have died. Um, and it, it, it's really horrifying. And uh, it, you know, that's the sort of thing that can happen in an institution fairly quickly. Other questions for Commissioner Squirrel, who has to get to an 11. Hopefully, you're you're meeting right where you are, not having to. Yes, I yes I am meeting here. Um, I am happy to provide a quick update on the residential system of care if that would yeah, be helpful would be. for folks. I think that was one of the other agenda items that um, yeah. the committees wanted an update on. Um, so I can speak generally about the residential system um, is uh, under stress um, due to staffing shortages. Um, obviously, individuals who work in our residential facilities across the state are um, managing their own, you know, whether it's having to take care of their children at home or, you know, self-quarantining for good reason. Um, but we are certainly experiencing staffing shortages across the state. Um, I just have to say our providers, uh, community mental health programs um, are just doing a tremendous job in trying to step up um, to continue to provide that 24 seven care to individuals. Our community mental health agencies and others are being very creative in terms of how do we redeploy staff from other areas. So for example, school-based mental health staff um, that might not have as much of a workload right now, how do we redeploy them to our residential system? across the adult system for all of our intensive recovery residences. Um, they are all open and currently accepting referrals. Um, many of them are currently full. Um, some have, you know, uh, again, managing staffing shortages that we are. Um, that is um, quite a feat um, that they've been able to continue to do that. Um, I think everyone is looking very carefully at their referral processes, you know, obviously implementing appropriate screening that's aligned with the guidance that comes from the CDC and BDH. Um, our crisis beds are um, running at about 50% capacity right now. Um, our emergency services teams, they're also working, um, everyone's adjusting to more of a you know, telehealth kind of approach to emergency services and crisis teams. Um, so I think we are adjusting to that. Um, I think an area where we are a little bit vulnerable right now um, is some of our adult crisis beds facilities across the state um, that are operating at much lower capacity um, or needing to close temporarily. Um, another area uh, would be group homes. Um, many of our designated community mental health agencies have group homes. Again, experiencing some staffing challenges, um, you know, trying to, um, many of us are looking to combine programs um, so that we can kind of maximize staffing. Um, so whereas you might've been staffing two facilities, can you consolidate so you only have to staff one? Um, again, individuals are being, you know, very thoughtful about that, um, doing the best that they can. An example of this is the Department of Mental Health is actually we are moving the residents from the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence um, to VPCH uh, because we use the same staff to staff both of those facilities in two different locations. Um, and in order for us to have adequate staffing for both of those, we have moved those individuals um, to VPCH. Um, they're not admitted to the hospital. Um, they're in their own unit, which is very separate um, from the rest of VPCH. Granted, some might argue that VPCH is actually nicer 
um, than the current middle sex, but that's just an example of how we're really having to be nimble and creative um, so that we can maintain appropriate staffing. In terms of the children and youth programs, um, there has been some decompression that has occurred over the past few weeks. Um, so for youth or children who are placed through DMH, um, all of our programs have communicated with families and with the department. Um, some have determined that it's clinically appropriate um, to have the child or youth go home temporarily um, during this period with support via telehealth. Um, so again, where it's appropriate and where a discharge makes sense temporarily, um, trying to work on those pieces. Um, programs are also determining uh, what capacity and what space they have for isolating COVID positive youth should that happen. So our residential programs are really assessing that um, across the state. Um, and creating their own, I think, internal plans. We've asked that all of the programs keep the Department of Mental Health informed of any significant staffing concerns or significant loss of capacity. Um, so currently, you know, I think we're, we're managing within our residential system of care. I, I do feel like in, on any given day, you know, we're all kind of on the edge of you know, if a program has to close entirely, you know, how do we create capacity for those individuals? Um, on the funding side of things, um, sorry, I don't wanna jump around too much, but it is connected. Um, DMH and DCF are working with the Division of Rate Setting DIVA uh, to also identify mechanisms within the PNMI rules um, to alleviate some of the fiscal pressures of low utilization, again, kind of in that same approach of we want to ensure the flow of funding for residential programs so they can support adequate staffing and continue to serve children and youth in their care. Um, so that's another kind of fiscal strategy um, because we, where there's appropriate discharges makes sense. It helps them manage. Um, we also want to make sure that their cash flow um, remains positive so that they can continue um, to operate. So that's another area that we're looking at. Um, and then again, looking at the hazard pay for those uh, programs as well. So um, uh, uh, before I ask my question, Dick, maybe we should go around and see if anyone has a specific question. I, yeah, do, we... I have a question that might, is a different, to it's, a, it's a topic about this, but it, it's, not, it's not anything yeah. that I've heard the commissioner mention yet. I so. think the commissioner has about five to 10 minutes left. So we should probably right. take advantage of that if there are any questions. Jenny, go ahead. Okay, so um, commissioner, as <laughs> all of this is going on and it, you know, you're on the fly and we completely understand that and trying to make some very good decisions that are gonna help people and keep them protected as much as possible. Are you keeping track of the decision-making process then the protocols that are being used uh, the, for triage or for whatever decisions are being made around individual patients and then collectively around the various organizations you're working with? I, I'm, I, I can think of some scenarios that would come up in the future that would involve both judici judiciary and the medical environment. So are you keeping track of how those decisions are being made? And I include in that all the individual uh, decisions about who goes where, when, and how. Yeah, it's, it's a, a great question, Senator. Um, and certainly as we are um, moving quickly, um, but making all of our decisions um, in the best interest of continuing to provide um, access to care um, for Vermonters, um, we're making sure that we're taking into consideration, you know, like for hospital level of care, um, we have the opportunity to have more flexibility under 1135 waivers. Um, so that creates some cover. We're making sure that everything is vetted to our, through our legal teams, um, through licensing and protection. So there isn't a decision that's made without um, collaborating with um, our local CMS authority to make sure like, yes, this move is warranted yes, you know, we can do this. So we're kind of ticking those boxes. And at the same time, um, working very closely uh, with other partners and advocacy partners um, like Disability Rights of Vermont, uh, Legal Aid, 
NAMI Vermont, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. Um, so we have been working very hard to include those groups in our decision making um, and ensure that they are looped in um, and apprised uh, as we move forward. And then of course, um, there's the entire legal system, um, particularly for those who are involuntary under the care and custody of the commissioner. So it's been a huge lift behind the scenes to try to figure out how do we create capacity for um, Tele court, if you will, um, given you know some of the legal connections as well. So I can assure you that we are we are putting taking all those things into consideration as we're making these decisions um, and trying to check all of those boxes as we go. In addition to um, you know we're we're talking about moving individuals um, under uh, stressful circumstances who are already experiencing um, some significant mental health needs. So being thoughtful about including their family members, um, using our social work teams to include um, um, their guardians, et cetera. Um, so trying to be nimble, um, but also be very thoughtful about our decision-making. And, and it's gonna get worse. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that having some of this work done up front, it sounds like you're, everyone, and it, that you're working with the right groups and uh, but having some of the decision making up front to avoid the conflict later on is of course important. I appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions for Commissioner Squirrel before she has to leave? Thanks so much, Commissioner. Okay, thank you all. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, do you want to take a couple minute break, Jenny, or do you want to plow right in? We lost Jenny. I guess we lost her. No, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm sorry. Um, we had scheduled a five minute break, but let's you know. let's do that. Let's do that. So we some of us we've been on uh, Zoom quite a bit. Why don't we just uh, take ourselves off video and mute ourselves and take a five minute break. We do that. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. <laughs> okay. Call at 11 o'clock. Yes, please. One of the issues I don't, is Jenny back? Hi, hi Jenny. I'm back. How are you? Good. Uh, maybe we could start the, with uh, Commissioner Hutt and try to uh, fill her in a little bit about where we we talked with the other two commissioners about um, how they're handling the surge and the, the problems that are arisen from COVID-19. But there is one issue that Judge Grierson's here for, and that is the Supreme Court decision. I don't know if it's a decision or they're uh, about uh, parent-child contact in light of the governor's stay-at-home safe, safe order. And that involves obviously DCF and maybe other departments of state government. But I know a lot of us over the weekend, I think all of us over the weekend got emails from the Vermont Foster Parents Association, <clears throat> very upset about having to provide parent-child contact during this um, crisis and how they were going to keep themselves safe as well as their foster children. So I don't know, maybe judged if you want to start with that. Is that okay, Jenny? Sounds good to me. Good idea. You have to unmute yourself, Judge. Sorry. Uh, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> And uh, thank you for the invitation. If we're keeping a record uh, for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Um, I obviously did have correspondence. Um, again, I think with uh, Commissioner Schatz uh, requesting the court consider a uh, stay of uh, any in-person parent-child contact with uh, children in DCF custody. I also received um, a um, correspondence from Senator Sears having that he had uh, received from a foster parents association uh, as well as representative Haas um, 
from her committee, uh, all relating to the same issue. The court did uh, consider Commissioner Schatz's request over the weekend, um, but their response uh, to that request was that they did not feel that a stay of all in-person uh, contact should be the subject of a, of a blanket order, um, but rather would leave it to the individual uh, circumstances of each case to be addressed by the judge in the county where the issue arose. I, I would add to that that although the request came from Commissioner Schatz and the foster parents involved with um, the children in custody, the issue is certainly much broader than that. It involves um, issues relating to parent-child contact, whether the children are in custody um, or whether it's a, uh, a domestic uh, order that's in effect. And so the courts have been fielding uh, questions um, both from uh, DCF as well as from uh, domestic uh, cases on how to handle these situations. And they have been addressed um, in the courts um, on an individual basis. The, the difficulty is that every case is fact specific. Um, and I think even Commissioner Schatz would have to admit that uh, because uh, the children may be in custody of DCF, uh, it may be that there was significant contact uh, between the parents um, and their children, even though in DCF custody, leading to a reunification plan. And parents are oftentimes in a different phases of, of that contact. In other words, it may be contact that is limited to uh, only a, a couple of hours a week, um, but there may be on the other end of the spectrum, there may be situations <clears throat> where the parents have had significant contact, maybe overnight contact with the hope that within a relatively short time, um, the children would be back with them. So I think that's where the court uh, thought it was important that each of those different uh, circumstances be considered rather than a blanket uh, order in those situations. Um, I, I think that's, um, they, they haven't changed their, their position uh, since then, but that's, that's the, the substance of, of that request. How, how available would be a court hearing if a foster parent was very concerned, uh, relayed that concern to the social worker who then asked for a court hearing? How, I mean, we know that we're having trouble right now. Um, how difficult would that be? I don't want to say it won't be difficult. It, it's difficult because we are operating all the courts on reduced staff levels and uh, judge time. But having said that, every court is operational. Um, and when those requests come in, they are included as one of the priority cases uh, under the court's uh, so-called administrative order 49 and specifically uh, request to suspend uh, parent-child contact, either with uh, cases in DCF custody or domestic cases, are a proceeding that will go ahead um, with the court. So we will get those cases in for hearing um, as quickly as we can. Would and Ken or Christine been scheduled? Would Ken or Christine like to comment on this? Sure. This is Ken Schatz, Commissioner of uh, Department for Children and Families. I appreciate Judge Gerson providing that information. And to, to back it up a little bit, I just want to be clear that this was an incredibly difficult place for us to be. This is one of the um, incredible difficult challenges posed by uh, COVID-19, the pandemic. Our, our mission, our charge is not only to protect children, but also to support families. We appreciate um, the value of contact um, with respect to children and families, even within um, the abuse and neglect system. The reality is, let me be clear, we're not restricting 
all contact. We have worked very hard with families to have uh, the capacity for remote contact, video conferencing or by phone. But based on the uh, recommendation of Dr. Levine, the Commissioner of Health, we did submit the, the request to the court that Judge Grierson referred to. We know how difficult this situation is. We respect the decision made by the court. And so what we are doing is working with our family service workers, our foster parents, um, and our assistant AGs and state's attorneys as appropriate. Uh, if we do have a disagreement with families about uh, in-person contact, then we will be submitting those motions as a, a Senator Sears and Judge Grierson referenced. Uh, again, we're doing our best to try to resolve these um, without having to go to the courts. The overwhelming majority of cases, to be clear, have been resolved uh, to have remote contact rather than an in-person contact, but there are some that uh, have not agreed to do so. And so we're carefully looking at each one of those situations individually to um, address them on a case-by-case -case basis. I do want to mention one thing here, and that's Judge Grierson. Thank you very much for being here. And I want to remind everyone who may be listening outside of the committee um, on YouTube that you are the messenger, not necessarily. So to be clear, your message is, is from the Supreme Court. You are not, um, you're delivering the message. Thank, thank you for that clarification, Senator. Um, I, I will add, though, that what the court, uh, in, in considering this issue, what they really said was that, in response to, to Commissioner Schatz's uh, question, was that the, the governor's order of stay home, stay safe, in and of itself, uh, was not the, the reason to issue a blanket order suspending contact. And as, as uh, Commissioner Schatz has indicated, it doesn't mean that we're going to um, not modify the contact that's going forward. And in many, many cases, uh, the contact may have to change, but it may go to remote. And I think that DCF has done a, a good job in making that available to any of these parents. So uh, it's not as if the, the trial judges are saying, okay, we're not gonna change the contact that's in place. We're not gonna deny it, uh, but we're looking for other ways when those cases come in to allow that contact to uh, to go forward, perhaps in a different way on a temporary basis, but um, that, that's Senator what Sears, can I weigh in here? Please do, John. Um, this is for the benefit of all who have not heard this conversation before in a different committee or in some other manner, but as somebody who has <coughs> practiced law for 37 years, I've spent a considerable amount of my time in family court and I've been involved in DCF cases representing both the parents and the children from time to time. Um, I want to say, first off, that the statutes that we have that deal with DCF taking children out of homes are designed for really two things in, in priority. The first is to keep children safe. The second is to develop a case plan that can reunite parents with children under the safest circumstances possible. And those two things are critically important in this discussion. Case plans are developed that often require programming wrapped around parent-child contact. And if parent-child contact is interrupted, the case plan's ability to be completed becomes more difficult. Um, in divorce situations, there are lots of times when one party would love to have this current emergency as an excuse not to have to deal with the other side. And I think we have to be cognizant as a state that our statutes are designed in such a way that in divorce cases, we try to maximize parent-child contact with each parent for the benefit of the kids. So I am very happy to have heard Judge Grierson's response to all of this because I think it is imperative that these situations be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. There may very well be a situation where one parent, for instance, gets 
um, a positive reading in a COVID-19 test, then that might actually be very um, important for the courts to take on as an emergency basis. But the blanket rule issued by the governor was not intended to cease all parent-child contact as it normally occurs. And we had that answered specifically some time ago, and I forget which committee we were meeting in at that time. It might have been joint rules. But the long and the short of it is parent-child contact is supposed to take place as it normally does. And unless and until you can come up with an argument uh, that somebody is potentially in the line of fire for a COVID-19 infection, um, we should not be trying to um, revise things that would make parent-child reunification in DCF cases or the uh, custodial battles that we often see more difficult. And I just wanted to leave it at that and hope that the uh, committees listening here now can take that message back to constituents. Thanks. I appreciate that, Joe, but um, I, I must caution that if, if you're a foster parent and you're worried about this crisis that we're all facing, and you're worried about a parent coming in who may or may not have been found to have the COVID-19, your concern is, you know, is legitimate. And, um, so I, I can't discount that. I understand the law and understand the rules, but these are um, extraordinary times and uncharted waters. So I appreciate that. Are there other comments for Judge Grierson or Ken about this issue? I have a question, Dick, and I yep. think Dick McCormick does also. Yeah. Okay. Um, why, don't, why don't you go to Dick McCormick first and then I'll come to mine. Thank you. <clears throat> Judge Grierson. You are unmuted. Did, did, did the court did take the court into, take uh, into uh, or did the court uh, give the consideration? Court give consideration? Uh, I'm getting uh, an echo getting here. An echo. Senator White, Senator is, White back is back on. Back on. Okay. Uh, Judge Grierson, did the, uh, did the court consider uh, uh, simply shifting the, the burden of, 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 of asking for an exception? In other words, extending the, uh, the the separation order, which is universal otherwise, uh, that could be extended to visitation and people who want an exception come to court and ask for that exception, uh, explaining why they their need to be with their kids is uh, trumps the, the public health issue, as opposed to now where, 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 where we're being told is, if you want to protect public health, you need a court order to do it. And I don't think you get into court real fast. So um, I guess, so did the was that any part of the court's deliberations of the court or the court's uh, finding? Um, I might have to have you clarify the question, Senator. When you talk about the separation, you're talking about the, the distance, the, the six foot? We, we, the, the need, the, the best way to defend against the epidemic is for people to have physical separation. I mean, I, I'm, I'm living at home. My wife and I are not seeing anybody. We're home alone all the time because we were asked to do that because of a public health emergency that trumps people's right to make a living. Trump, I mean, trumps everything apparently but this. And, and my sense, would, uh, what, what I'm asking is, did the court consider the possibility that it could respect that public health necessity? And as you had said, every case is individual, it should have a court order, that the court order would be, okay, in this family's case, we don't well, uh, impose the, um, the separation. By separation, yes, I mean, we're all separating our, it's why we're meeting electronically. I think it would be fair to say that the court was certainly cognizant of of the of the public health risks involved in this in this decision. Um, but when you have um, and, and it is it's a balancing of risks in, in some respects. You you have to also look at um, not only the public health risks, but uh, some of these cases 
the, the attachment between the parent and the child is so critical that we've got to find a way of maintaining it. And so that's why I think it, uh, it has to be handled on a case by case basis. And, and I think that recognizing this new, um, as, as Senator Sears said, this new world, uh, that this distancing is, um, is critical to everyone's health, uh, particularly the okay. child. Yeah, I, I, I have not expressed myself clearly. I understand the need for it to be a case by case. I understand the need for a case by case court decision. What I'm asking is in that, the, the, the decision that the court would be asked for. You have a rule, now you're gonna deviate from the rule. The rule could be the parents get to see the kids. And someone who thinks that's not healthy, that's not safe would ask for an exception. Or the rule could be that the separation, the quarantine that's applying to the entire universe except this is the rule here too, unless you want an exception. In which case you come and you ask the court for an exception. Right. It's the same. It's the same two possibilities. I'm saying one is the is the rebuttable presumption. The other is the exception, and it could go either way. And I'm wondering if the court looked at that. You know, Senator, I, I can't say that the court looked at it exactly that way because I wasn't privy to all of their discussion. But I will say that the 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 fundamental rule that we've gone forward on is that if there is an order that's in effect of parent-child contact, whether we're talking about DCF or whether we're talking about some of the domestic cases like Senator uh, Benning pointed out, uh, what we've saying is if there's a rule in effect, we expect the parties to honor that, that rule. Uh, if they are aware of, if they have information that the risks of COVID-19 have uh, change dramatically uh, the the risks involved for that existing order to change, then they come into court to to ask for that change. No, no, I understand what the what the ruling was. I'm asking. Okay, I I think I I guess I'm not getting it. You're not giving me an answer to my question. I'm and, sorry. And it may be because I don't understand the the question. So it may I it's. Think my could, could someone? Uh, my guess is other. Well, I think that do. Senator someone McCormick, else rephrase my question. I think Senator McCormick is asking: Is did the Supreme Court look at it from that the um, that the default was you don't visit versus no. the default that you do? No, they did not. Okay. They did not. Thanks. My question might be related, but it's a it's probably a. Okay. A, a dumb question, sorry. Um, but we're under um, emergency rule. And one of the things that I uh, continue to try to understand is the extent to which the emergency folks, Department of Health, um, become, <coughs> take charge. And the relationship between the Department of Health or the emergency folks and uh, the judiciary. And I think, so this is, I think this, for me, this really underlies the discussion we're having. And I don't know whether, uh, we, we tried to look at this a little bit in our committee before we began any of our debate on our legislation related to um, the emergency, understanding our role, uh, what what's doable, what's not doable, what's essential, what isn't. but. So that relationship, and I guess I might, I, I might be throwing this question out to Bryn, um, and I don't know if it's something that can be answered, or is it that the judiciary is separate? Um, how, how does this all sugar off? Well, Bryn may want to weigh in on this, but clearly there is a, 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 a separation of, of powers issue in these um, in many of the questions that have come before the court um, and unrelated to, to parent-child custody, there have been similar requests about uh, stays uh, being imposed, for instance, on evictions and, and mortgage foreclosures. I'll be addressing a committee on that later this afternoon. And this court has taken the position um, that in those cases, the, 
those are policy decisions for either the executive branch or the legislative branch to, to impose that type of stay. Um, the, this, this process though, these issues are developing every day. Um, and the court meets regularly to consider all of these issues so that um, I don't want to anyone to think that the court isn't considering <coughs> issues as the circumstances change. I, I, but there is that issue of who has the uh, authority to issue certain types of orders. And, and going back to Senator McCormick's question, I, I think I understand it better now. Um, if we created a default position that was different than the existing orders, that would essentially be a blanket order. And, and that's what they have so far indicated they are not inclined to do that. Um, Ken, but, but I, and I don't want to belabor the issue, Judge, but could, for example, I'm familiar with the case um, that uh, where the child was in a residential program and the child got just like we're doing today. Um, I don't know if it was over Zoom, Skype or FaceTime or whatever, had a great deal of contact with their parent just as they would have had in person. And does that meet that need? Is that an agreeable thing or? The, the remote contact? Yeah, this was in a yeah. residence program. So it may be considered different in terms of the contact, parent-child contact. I, I, I hope that what I'd said earlier, the court isn't looking to deny contact. They're looking for different ways of preserving that contact. And if it can be done remotely, and I know that in talking with Commissioner Schatz, of the over a thousand families that are involved with, with the, the department in custody, there's a relatively small number of cases where they haven't been able to reach agreement. And obviously those are the cases that are coming our way. That doesn't mean that our order in if, would end up being exactly what the, the commissioner's office is looking for. In other words, we would say, we have to change the, the contact you have now because of COVID-19 and we agree that in your case, that remote contact is the, the best solution. And so we, we're we looking for those types of solutions. Thank you, Judge, I appreciate it. And uh, with the half an hour we have left, if it's okay with you, Jenny, I'd like to hear from Commissioner Schatz and Commissioner Hutt about how they're dealing with their residential population, um, as well as as what plans they have for hazard pay that we asked uh, Commissioner Squirrel about. Is that all right to move on? No, that's fine. Uh, just, uh, just so you know, uh, we have um, Commissioner Hutt scheduled tomorrow as well as Commissioner Squirrel. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can cover some of this. Some of it will not be redundant with what we're doing. Some of it will be. So this is good. We can triage. Yeah. Thank you. Judge, thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you. You need to get somewhere else. You're welcome to stay and listen in, but. I, I've got a, if, if you don't need me, I have a few other I things that. I, I think we um, appreciate your joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just also want to let you know, there's a handout from Ken Chats on the website that I just posted. Yep. Uh, there's a handout about the uh, In -state. capacity. Do you want to yeah. lead off, Ken, with both of those? questions or you and Christine? So I will ask Christine to take the lead in describing uh, the status of our residential and foster care system in light of COVID-19. All right. All right. Can, everyone... Ken and I have both of our computers in the same room, so it makes it a little interesting when I switch over. Um, so what I would like to start off with is um, if you have, a, have had a chance to look at the handout that um, we just sent over, um, want to give you an update of our residential system of care. Largely, a lot of the topics that the, uh, the items that Sarah Squirrel highlighted are similar um, things that we're experiencing in our system as well. And so um, clearly COVID-19 is causing many of our residential programs in Vermont to reduce their capacity. And that was the handout that I sent. So in a, in a normal environment, we have, um, approximately 144, is that the number I came up with? 
maybe it's 114 beds in our in-state residential capacity. And so uh, we are currently down 63 beds. And this is in response to, as Sarah mentioned, staffing shortages. Um, frankly, we have um, people, whether they're exposed or hunkering down um, and um, not able to, um, to show up at work. And that is certainly um, causing some pressures in our system. Um, you'll also see in the handout that most of our programs in state are full. One has closed. And of course, we now have five beds at Suite 12. We had 30 at Woodside, but let's be clear, we weren't, we were, we've really been at three to five for the last six months at yeah. least. Um, so we, um, so that really- When it says full, happening. does that mean that like Allen Brook has a COVID capacity of three and does that mean there are three there? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so also most of our out-of-state programs are no longer accepting referral, new referrals. And so where we might've had a youth, for example, um, previously at Woodside or at Suite 12, that was slated to interview at an out-of-state program and move there. Once COVID hit, those bed options were no longer available. And so what we're doing is we're, we're managing those kids in, in state. Um, what I do want to say is that um, in the middle of March, right as COVID was really hitting here, we had 104 children and youth that were placed in state, in, in state residential programs. And um, just about a week and a half later, we reduced that to 80 children and youth placed in state residential programs. And we did that intentionally. So if there were kids that could move back home or into foster care from residential placements, um, we, made, we made that happen through, I think, a, very much um, a, a huge effort on behalf of our staff and our, and our partners, frankly, um, through a multitude of um, education planning and treatment team meetings and conference calls and transportation efforts to make sure that we got kids who could go home back home. Um, and, you know, clearly we did this in response to COVID to make sure that um, we helped our programs to have the adequate capacity that they would need in light of COVID. Um, so we, um, I also wanted to just touch briefly on the issue that um, we are, as, as you likely know, with the Agency of Human Services standing up what is called the AHS Wellness and Recovery Center in Plainfield. And so our expectation is um, that if we have youth either in foster care or in residential programs that become COVID positive, they, have the, they, they will have the option of moving there. Um, what we are hoping in our system is that our kids and youth can stay in place, shelter in place in foster care or in residential programs. And that is certainly our expectations of both. Um, but we do know that there may come a point in time where our staffing capacity in our programs or in our foster homes, frankly, where those, those children may not be able to stay and then we will have the ability to move them over to the, to the site in Plainfield. Um, we do think that um, we're working now um, to, to staff that appropriately. We have Brenda Gooley from FSD um, as our main point person there, and she is helping to manage that new site. Um, and I think we are feeling quite good about the fact that we have that um, as an emergency backup option. And I think that's really gonna help our system to have the capacity that it needs. Um, we also, um, we have um, issued guidance um, to our field staff that if there are kids in foster care that were close to reunification, we wanted those kids to move back home wherever it was safely possible. Again, knowing that COVID was coming and we wanted to make sure that anyone who could go home um, and was already on a track to do that um, could move in that direction. And so we did that as well. We are working to address respite for our foster parents. Um, clearly, that is an issue that foster parents need um, in a in a you know in a, a good healthy environment, and and certainly even you know now even more of a pressure. And so we're working with foster parents to issue guidance about respite. And we're also looking to determine if we can support foster parents financially with a stipend if they are caring for a sick child with COVID. And so those are some of the things that we are working on. Um, standing up and um, investigating now to see if we can add those additional supports to the field. Um, I do want to tell you that we have seen a 60% decrease in the numbers of calls to our child abuse and neglect hotline. 
compared to March of 2019. Um, but we've also seen a 60 to 70 percent. Um, uh, we've seen actually 60 to 70 percent of those calls that we're getting now being accepted as intakes. Um, and so we have a historical average of about 30% of our calls that, that get accepted as intakes. And so while we have a lower number of people that are calling, we do have a higher rate of accepted intakes. Um, and I was just on a call this morning with other New England commissioners, and I will tell you that every state is seeing the same thing happen. And um, there's a lot of speculation as to why, of course, kids are not in a lot of community spaces, they're not in schools. It's not unlike potentially a summer response, although a lot of kids in summer are still in summer camps and still in daycare. And so we, we are seeing this um, at least in New England and I'm guessing um, nationally as well. Um, one other thing, we are um, working um, to support our older youth in foster care and those who have aged out of foster care. Our youth development program has been communicating out um, to really try to um, get word out that, that that program is available to youth, especially if they were in college and their college closed and they didn't have a place to stay. Um, they can certainly reach back out to that program and get help in terms of um, um, finances and, um, and all of the supports that our older youth in and formerly in foster care need. So let me stop there. I know I've thrown a lot of information at you. Uh -huh. And any questions? Uh, pretty thorough, actually. Very thorough. Mm -hmm. Senator Cummings, if you unmute yourself, we can hear you. I'm unmuted. Yeah. Um, needless to say, the um, playing field uh, plans has kind of landed in the town, they say, unannounced at the select board. And there's all kinds of stories that mental health people and youth at risk are going to be there and you can't confine them and they can run into town sure. and um, there's just a lot of kind of panic going on and can tell me what I can say to kind of quell that. So this is, is Ken Schatz. I I'm glad to respond, Senator Cummings. I appreciate you raising that issue and concern. The, the program there is being um, set up by the State Emergency Operations Center. We are very mindful of those community concerns. We're definitely, ha as, as um, Christine mentioned, we definitely will have staff on site to help manage the facility. I know in light of the concerns, we're also going to make sure there's appropriate security on the site uh, to uh, address those kind of concerns. I, I do believe we, you can tell your constituents that we recognize the issues, the concerns. We're committed to make this a safe place, both for the uh, people who are residing there, but also for the community at large. Obviously the challenges of this pandemic are significant for all of us and we wanna take care of, of of each other as best we can in a safe manner. Glad to, to talk offline with respect to more detail if that's helpful, Senator. But again, I think we are making sure that we stand up both enough care providers and supervision to make sure that it is a safe place. I think that's reassuring. I felt that that's the answer I'd receive. But I think just the fact that because of the emergency, it's like the testing center that opened up apparently without any local um, information um, down at Landmark College. This one just kind of got sprung on people and people are stressed and tense. And I think just need some reassurance that we're gonna take all the reasonable precautions we can uh, to protect their health and welfare. And they're not gonna have kids walking around town coughing on people. Senator White would like to comment if she could. We'll put on our earphones. Muted. You are unmuted. Thank you. Um, I think that it's one thing to um, assure people afterwards, but I, I was the one that brought up the issue about the landmark. It's very frustrating to, that decisions are being made without any 
any uh, contact or any um, involvement of the local communities. And I know when the testing site was set up down here, no one had ever contacted Brattleboro Hospital or any of the practitioners. And I understand the same thing is happening in Plainfield. So I have a call with um, Secretary Smith at noon as soon as we're done on this call, because I think that we are making tremendous mistakes by not involving the community people first with the planning and the decisions instead of making the decisions and then trying to reassure people. That's my comment. Thanks, thanks to that. Thanks to that. Uh, uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Schatz, Schatz, you want to, while we still have you and Christine, comment on the hazard pay for people that are working on the front lines? Sure, glad to do that. The rea as uh, Commissioner that School, as a term, by the way, I don't. I understand, and I was going to say that we appreciate the uh, commitment of both state employees and all of our community providers in supporting um, the system as a whole and individuals um, who may exhibit symptoms. So we are, as Senator Squirrel indicated, as uh, Commissioner Squirrel indicated, uh, carefully looking at what financial supports can we provide. Uh, both to our state staff, but also our community providers. So again, as uh, Commissioner Skirl mentioned, we are looking with respect to the residential system of care. We are literally meeting this afternoon with our rate setting folks because it is the PNMI system that operates to provide payments to those programs. We are going to look at and try to figure out what additional financial supports we can provide to residential providers. Similarly, as uh, Christine mentioned, we're definitely looking with respect to foster parents who may be caring for, for children with COVID-19 symptoms. We're trying to see what we can provide to them in terms of additional financial support and, and again, as I mentioned, state employees are also um, on the line here, and we're looking to support them also. So those things are all works in progress at this point. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Hutt, oh, she left. <laughs> are there questions for Commissioner Schatz? Thank you, Ken and Christine. Commissioner Hutt, did you have a, um, you know, the questions really are about the, the uh, residential and how you're handling the folks in your care. Um, and you've already heard the question the, from Christine. So if you could keep fill us in on what's going on there. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you're meeting with Health and Welfare tomorrow. So that may lead to more it's questions. It's actually tomorrow. Friday. It's actually Friday. I, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. I was quickly looking when you said that, Senator Lyons, and thinking, I don't think that's tomorrow. I um, apologize. No, that's okay. Um, we should just be able to stand in our backyards and yell to each other. So maybe that sounds, would be sounds good to me. So that's 10 feet away, or at least. <laughs> um, so, so let me talk a little bit about the global long term care residential system, which, you know, as a subset of that are the the residential care um, facilities that Christine and Ken have been talking about and that Sarah talked about earlier. But, but my, um, my work and the work of the department has been up a couple of levels. We have 36 nursing homes in the state of Vermont and about 132 residential care homes. So whether those are level three residential care homes, level four therapeutic community residences, different assisted living, so different licenses, different um, sets of regulations for each, but it is an enormous number of residential care facilities, long-term care residential care facilities across the state of Vermont. Um, so EF has been really focused on, on those residential programs that are supporting their children. I know that Sarah Squirrel has been very focused on those that are supporting kids with mental health issues. And, and my um, focus has been um, much more global to just consider that whole group and some of the issues that, um, that we're up against. 
when you think about the Dale populations in general, obviously they, they hit, they check all the boxes for those Vermonters that are probably most vulnerable to this virus. So older Vermonters, Vermonters with disabilities that may have underlying health conditions. And so um, it's been, as it is true for every department and every commissioner, um, overwhelming to try to kind of uh, to understand how best to wrap our heads and our arms around supports for that. Um, so we've been reaching out really specifically to the long-term care residential facilities um, to offer guidance, direction, trying to sort through <coughs> what VDH has to offer in terms of best practices, guidance documents, looking at what the CDC has. We've been assembling that and pushing it out at some level, probably overwhelming some of the smaller providers, but wanting to make sure that they do have information available to them. And we've been hosting phone calls, collecting questions, pushing out responses to those questions on these phone calls, where we bring in the Vermont Department of Health, our division of survey and certification, so that we can understand exactly what people are wondering about and answer those questions directly. We did that for an hour and a half on Friday. We'll do it again next week um, and continue to push information out that way. I think that Christine noted this as she was talking about it. The goal, the first line of defense across all of this is enabling people to shelter in place. When you think about long-term care, those older Vermonters that are in residential care or nursing home care, those are their homes. They don't necessarily have other places to go to. There aren't biological families or other alternatives. And so trying to support those facilities to keep supporting the people that live there has been um, paramount. And candidly, it's the thing that's keeping me awake at night. Because as soon as the staffing becomes impacted, as soon as there aren't enough staff to hold together, especially some of these very <coughs> small programs, it's going to become problematic. Um, and that, that staffing can be impacted for a variety of reasons. You could see individuals that are sick themselves, individuals that are caring for sick family members, or individuals that are just afraid. Um, you know, we can't, no employer can force a staff to come in through this. And I think what they're trying to do is just hold together their staffing as, as well as they can. <coughs> we continue to try to support that and answer questions as we can. So pushing out information about essential childcare, I was able to do that a little bit today because some of the smaller providers didn't realize that they might be counted as essential healthcare staff and could access that. So I talked with the child development division this morning and pushed out that information. But I think what's really, um, I'm just looking at my notes really quickly, what I think we are um, doing at the same time is trying to plan for that surge capacity that Christine talked about. So is there a place, whether that's the Goddard College site or alternate sites, and we're not, we're not there yet, but trying to identify if there might be places where it would be logical to shift people if there is a staffing crisis in a provider. Um, the one other thing I will say is that the standards of um, information and capacity across those providers is really distinct and different depending on the provider and depending on the size of the provider. So just to give you a couple of examples, nursing homes are federally, federally required to have infection prevention and control plans. They're required to have on-site nurses that are trained specifically in infection prevention and control. They typically have the capacity to isolate, to cohort staffing the way that they need to to prevent additional infections. I think we've seen examples when you think about Burlington Health and Rehab of a place that was doing a good job but was struggling to get a handle on that because the virus spread so quickly. Um, there wasn't anything wrong with what Burlington Health and Rehab was doing at all. They were doing good work, but it is a very, um, it's an aggressive virus. And as we've heard more and more, it's easy to spread even when somebody's asymptomatic. So I think trying to keep up to date with that information about the virus and the standards that are required, that's something that our nursing homes can do. They have the capacity to do that. 
it's a struggle, but I think that they are managing that really well. I start to worry more when we get into residential care because there are not the same requirements. They don't have that capacity necessarily. And the difference between a residential care home, the size of Pillsbury, which most of you know, because that was in the news so much last year, it's 150 people. It's a part of a larger organization. The resources that that kind of an entity has or a Wake Robin has is very different than a very tiny residential care in the middle of the Northeast Kingdom who's supporting three people or four people. Um, and so we are trying to, um, I had a, a group, a cohort of our nurses in the survey department get trained in those infection control procedures so that they can be technical assistants to any facility that calls, can talk them through, can understand the layout of their facilities and help them to address that as it's happening. So I think that there's this one track of trying to keep it stable in those homes and then planning for what happens when we can't. And with 132 small residential care or medium and large size residential care, in addition to the nursing homes, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty large cohort to be paying attention to. So maybe I'll just pause there and see if there are questions. Questions. Question for Monica. Uh, Monica, thank you for that. That's a great overview. And I think um, what, what we heard yesterday from the hospitals and, <coughs> and the linkage with the Burlington um, rest care uh, rehab and rehab folks uh, was exactly what you have said, that this is really very difficult given what protocols are required or not required in terms of public health. My, my question, I think, is, um, and I'll ask this again on Friday, perhaps, um, what protocols are being put in place, even though they may not currently be required by law? Um, are, are some of these um, care facilities actually putting uh, health protocols in place? And, and can you talk about what it is that they are? <coughs> I'm sure they're all doing something. I, I think that they are all doing something. And again, it really depends on the size of the facility. But I think that the basic precautions are, are continue to be, um, even in the midst of new information, the, the most basic precautions are the ones that are, are most easily um, implemented in what most facilities are doing. So things like trying to keep residents um, somewhat separated from one another trying to cohort staffing so that specific staff are working with specific people as much as possible so you're not having a staff person be a vector for transmission. Basic hand washing, a heavy duty cleaning of all of those surfaces. Um, we also are working very hard to make sure that if there are requests from residential care homes or nursing homes for protective equipment for PPE, that those are prioritized at the Vermont Department of Health. And they've been great about pushing in, in equipment out the door when it's requested and required. Um, they've been screening staff. You know, we got ahead of this early on in terms of early on in the in the life of this virus. Vermont instituted, um, uh, the governor had a, an order around limiting visitors, prohibiting visitors, limiting visitors. And that happened really early on as did, as did the requirements even before the visitor prohibitions for screening, um, screening of residents and screening of staff with some basic questions about their health and well-being. So trying to really understand that and implementing that, that's been happening across the board in residential care. Um, uh, one of the questions on the table right now that I know the health department is working to answer is, um, is in response to that screening of staff people. So the best practice early on was, was that if you felt ill, regardless of whether or not it was COVID-19 symptoms, but just ill, you wouldn't come into work. And if you were manifesting any symptoms of COVID-19, you would make a decision with your healthcare provider about whether or not to be tested, but still you would not be going into work. So, so we may have um, separated from the ability to work healthcare workers that may or may not have actually been ill with COVID-19. And so that time period where they were self-isolating has been a tremendous burden in the healthcare system. Makes absolute sense, it's absolutely necessary, but 14 days 
is a really long time to isolate if you are in fact not COVID positive. And so I think we are trying to understand um, and Mark Levine is, is digging into this now. What are the most up-to-date recommendations about that? Because we are putting pressure on our workforce. And if it's the right thing to do, we've got to do it. But if it's not necessary, we need to mitigate that a little bit because it's wreaking havoc across the system. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the basic question, isn't it? Uh, what exactly, what, what protocols do we put in place? What's the timing on all of this? Um, and Department of Health is probably the best place to um, provide that information, but it's protective um, across the board now and in the future, so. And the, and the guidance is changing. I mean, I saw last night and then again today nationally, and yeah. I know that um, Commissioner Levine was referencing it a little bit even in the governor's press conference, maybe there are going to be new recommendations about protective equipment and masks. And, right. and the CDC is trying to keep up with this and, and really acknowledging that asymptomatic people, people who don't feel ill and aren't presenting any symptoms are, are it seems more and more carriers potentially or could be. And if you don't know that, some of the precautions, the basic precautions that we've been mandating may or may not be as effective. It's, it's, it's somewhat overwhelming to try to get a handle on something that keeps morphing in the I mean, way- Senator, Senator Ingram had a question, I think. And also Senator Westman wondered if Senator Baruch got a mask on. Uh, I was just gonna say he's up to date. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank, yeah, thank you. Um, yes, Commissioner Hutt, um, when you say you, that you're screening staff, could, uh, could you be a little more specific? Are, are you a, like actually administering uh, tests or are, we, are you taking uh, temperatures, you know, every day or what, or what, what does that mean? Yeah. Exactly? So the specific guidance originally, you will recall, was a screening going through a series of several um, questions. And, and even those changed in the period of time between when we started and, and now. But there were questions that were asking people to self-identify if they had traveled, if they were feeling ill, if they had temperatures. I think that most facilities at this point in time have moved towards, I certainly know nursing homes are doing this because it's part of the CMS guidance. And I think most residential care at this point in time and we did talk about this on the call with them last week, are screening to staff to see whether or not they have temperatures. Um, and again, some of the basic questions that came back from them, you know, we, we, we put out this guidance that said, just as an example, check your staff for temperature. And the question that came back was, well, how high does it need to be? Like, what's, what's the demarcation point? Because some people tend to run cool, some run warm. Um, so we were able to get some clear technical guidance out about that in terms of here's the mark that you need to utilize. Um, and, some of, and some people are checking staff more, more often during a shift. Um, recognizing that as they do that, they're going to be impacting their workforce potentially, which is a pretty intimidating thing when you're when you're tight like that. That, that um, actually leads to a question that I have, and, and maybe um, Ken or Christine can also respond. Do we have standards for staff and residential programs as to at what point should they not be working? Um, you know, I've I've heard reports. Uh, in other states where people are being asked to work when they're ill. I haven't heard that in this state at all, but <clears throat> are there any standards that you've developed for all programs that deal with residential? This is Ken. My view, my understanding is we are simply looking to the guidance issued by Dr. Levine or the Department of Health. We don't have anything separate that we have sent out. So, what so if somebody's that, feeling ill, they should not be working in a residential program. That's and, correct. In, in any site, because again, regard, but certainly not in residential programs or, or providing one-on-one -on -one care with anybody. So the Vermont Department of Health also has a HON network, Health Action Network. There are these alerts that they put out and we serendipitously added all of our licensed residential care and nursing homes to that Han network months and months and months ago for, for different reasons altogether, but it has proven to be a, a happy um, serendipitous move because the health department's um, health alerts go out to them directly. 
Um, they don't filter through us. They don't have to filter through DCF or through DMH. They go out directly from the health department, just as they do to hospitals. And so all of the information about staffing and screening and questions about um, protocols and procedures are, are pushed directly out to that network. We try to filter it and, and help it to be more understandable, but it's coming directly from the source. So in that way, I feel like this has been coordinated in terms of the information that we've been able to push out, even though, again, some information that's written for hospitals can seem very overwhelming to a small residential care provider, better for the information to be there than for them to not have it. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Jenny, do you have any closing yeah. remarks? No, just uh, thank you very much uh, for all the information. We're greatly appreciate, uh, appreciative of the time that you've taken to be here today. And um, Commissioner Hutt will um, be asking you some different questions on Friday, but certainly the information you've given us is exceedingly helpful. Great, right. thank you. Thank, thanks, Christine. Thank you. And I, I thank you all as well. And, and Ken and, and Christine and uh, anyone else who has information, could you update us after your meeting regarding the PNMI rate setting? Um, how that glad goes? To, glad to do so. Thank you so much. Committee, thank you all very much. Both committees, uh, I think it worked well. Um, judiciary, we'll try to meet again. Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm kind of waiting to see if we get called back to vote on remote, called back to vote remotely. Um, but so I'm kind of waiting. Is there anybody who wouldn't be able to make a Wednesday meeting? Okay, good. We, we may be doing some training on remote voting. Um, I don't know if it's just the House right now, the House committees, I'm waiting to hear on that, but I might be in touch with you guys to set that up with the chief. I guess it takes about an hour. So just let you guys know that. Okay. Well, okay. We'll, tr we'll try to work that out with Peggy and, and Bryn and Eric uh, for our staff to meet on Tuesday or Wednesday, depending upon what happens. Okay. Our committee will probably meet on uh, Tuesday and Thursday, given the training that's going on. I don't know whether we'll meet more than that, but we'll talk about that in committee tomorrow. Okay. Bryn, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All. Thank, you. thank you. I'm going to end the live stream now.